Thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, the cases which I'll be discuss, discussing uh, are from Prince Sultan Military and Medical City, where I was consultant for more than 12 years. And the images I have taken from my book um, and the guidelines I have taken from National Kidney Foundations. So first we start with a donor recipient issue. This is the case one. This is a 30 year old HIV positive patient on dialysis is asking for transplant, which of the following will not eliminate him from transplant considerations. A CD4 count of 200 for last three months, undetectable viral load for three months, compliance to heart for less than six months, previous history of VSD repair or none of the above. With this question, I just wanted to know uh, which of these following will be not a contraindication for transplant. These are the conventional transplant content contraindications. These are the previous contraindications, HIV infection, hepatitis B, C, obesity, mood disorders, age over 60, previous malignant disease, and blood group incompatibility. These were the previous uh, contraindications. But nowadays, the absolute contraindications are actually active sepsis, uncontrolled malignant disease, uncontrolled psychosis, active drug dependence, any medical conditions where the lifespan is shortened to up to one to two years, or the patient has a T cell positive CDC cross match. So this patient with this criteria, if the patient has a VSD repair will not be eliminated, but at least he has to have a CD4 count more than 200 for at least six months. And his viral load should be undetectable for at least six months. And his compliance to HIV drugs should be at least more than six months. And again, what I said, VSD repair is not a contraindication in this patient. So HIV patients, if they're compliant to, to medications, CD4 count is more than 200 for six months, can be included in transplant recipient program. Now we come to case two. This is a 24 year old live non-related donor. This case we have just encountered a few days back in Evercare Hospital. So this is the donor. So this is the donor angio, CT angiography. And you can see this donor has, has three vessels in one kidney. The other has four vessels. So shall we swap the donor or transplant is not possible or transplant is doable with good surgeon and transplant is contraindicated or we look for another donor. So if it is a cadaveric case where you have triple vessel, that is easy. For that, you can actually just to take all these vessels with aortic patch and then you can transplant. So this was taken from this paper, recent paper, but we have done in live related donor in 2014 in military hospital and our surgeon was uh, Dr. Taki Khan. He was a very good surgeon and the patient had very good graft function, and he's still uh, maintaining a creatine of less than 1.3. Now, this is the third case. This is a 50 year old patient who has been transplanted two years back. He was hepatitis C positive, and he was successfully treated pre transplant. Now he comes with recent onset of proteinuria, impaired graft function and this uh, rash in the leg. A biopsy was done from the rash and you can see there is a uh, hyaline microthrombi in the arterioles. And you can also see inflammatory infiltrate. A renal biopsy was done. You can see wild look like immune deposition and C3 deposition by IF. So, where you are expecting the deposits? Is it in the subepithelial space, subendothelial space, or in the mesangium, or all of the above, or there, is, there should not be any deposit? In fact, I have shown the deposits, so number five is eliminated. But if you see the electron microscopy, this patient has all the deposits in the subendothelium. So this is 
and also another view of the of the biopsy you can see there is a thrombi in the capillary loop so what's the diagnosis diagnosis is post transplant cryoglobulinemia in hepatitis c positive recipient so this is uh, actually uh, seen commonly cryoglobulin concentration should be actually kept uh, monitored and they often require plasma exchange and rituximab to keep them down so this was the patient actually this patient uh, that was the transplant time where this patient was given basiliximab for induction prednisone and also he was given low dose cyclophosphamide and cyclosporin and he was also given mmf and he was given plasma exchange uh, at as an induction before the transplant and then after transplant he came he comes here after two years and here also he was given uh, double filtration plasma exchange and toximab with this the patient maintained a very good function and was discharged home followed in clinic now this is the case 4 this is a 30 year old 4 months post transplant normal renal profile in the last clinic visit now he comes with fever creatinine of 180 wbc count is 3 or 3000 the platelet is 140 he has mildly elevated liver function test he is on tacrolimus mycophenolate and prednisone this is the biopsy of the kidney these are the tubular cells one of the cells is hugely enlarged with nuclear inclusion body so this is a cytopathic cell and with special stain you can also see this uh, cytopathic cells with nuclear inclusion bodies so now what is the diagnosis and what is the treatment so before we go to the diagnosis because it's quite obvious so what are the treatment options shall we give iv cancyclovir and stop mmf or shall we give oral valgancyclovir and stop mmf or shall we give oral gancyclovir and stop mmf shall we give ice iv acyclovir and stop mmf or shall we give immunoglobulin and oral gancyclovir this patient is actually having cmv disease so the the treatment option should be here iv gancyclovir and stop mmf and sometimes you can actually add immunoglobulin if you if there is uh, no financial strain so cmv is a is it you suspect when the patient have is having fever neutropenia and with hepatitis nephritis and pneumonitis and this sort of features they also comes with gi variety of git symptoms like colitis esophagitis gastritis and all these things so if you if you get all this combination in a in a transplant patient with low leukocytes and you should actually suspect cmv coronary retinitis is a rare uh, a rare presentation in transplant patient but if they happens it is usually late the diagnosis can be done also without biopsy if you have clinical symptoms and the uh, and the pneumonitis with lf impaired lfts and if you have uh, a cmv viral load of more than 10 to the power 3 copies in plasma uh that should be enough for diagnosis but usually the symptoms develops after a load of 10 to the power 5 for all patients if you get such cmv infected patients stop the azathioprine adja and mycophenolate then they should be actually given iv valgancyclovir iv gancyclovir oral valgancyclovir is equally effective uh, but we reserve them for uh, those who have milder symptoms Uh, for for uh, severe symptoms graft impairment iv gancyclovir is the drug of choice and you should be actually doing weekly quantitative pcr uh, and the pcr should be decreased to 50% of the initial value within first two weeks if you do not get this one then you can switch from valgancyclovir to gancyclovir or you can simply go for sirofovir or fosconazole if you have the facility of electron microscopy Uh, it's very useful you can actually show the viral inclusion bodies and that will uh, give you the definitive diagnosis regarding cmv pro- prophylaxis let's do this exercise uh, which statement is not true 
oral valgansoclavir and intravenous gansoclavir are equally efficacious in preventing CMV, CMV infection. Uh, recommended dose is 450 of gansoclavir. Prophylaxis also reduces the risk of herpes simplex and herpes joster. Prophylaxis reduces the incidence of Kaposi's sarcoma. Acyclovir should be restricted to situations where gansoclovir, well gansoclovir cannot be used uh, due to economic reasons. So let's see which option you choose. The best option here is the, which is not true, is the recommended dose of oral valgan circlovir of 450. But you will see most of the, our patients uh, coming uh, from transplant from Indo-Pak region are actually on this dose. But this dose also works uh, and also it is economically feasible, but the recommended dose is actually 900 milligram of uh, valgan circlovir. And that's the preferred agent, but the GAN cyclovir IV is equally effective, but this is uh, uh, more expensive and not actually uh, feasible to give uh, van GAN cyclovir IV for three months. Usually, you have to give a three months prophylaxis. However, if you have used ATG induction, then uh, you can go up to six months. Uh, with prophylaxis, you still have a 15% chance of late drug resistant stain. Now we come to case five, and that is a 40 year old uh, post transplant who presents with gradually deteriorating allograft function over one year. So that's not a good thing. Uh, this patient had a very good transplant. The creatine was less than one. Now he's getting graft dysfunction. So the biopsy was done, which uh, these are actually tubular cells uh, with pleomorphic nuclei. So this, you can see actually these are all uh, uh, damaged tubule and looks uh, cytopathic. And if you see the closer view, these are the tubular cells with uh, nuclear in inclusion body. And then here, this is a special strain, strain which is SV40 strain. You can actually see the uh, nuclei of the renal tubular epithelial cells uh, with translucent uh, or transparent center. This is another view. Uh, and then in a closer view, you can see these are the uh, nuclear inclusion bodies uh, with SV40 stain. And if you have the facility of electron microscopy, uh, which we had in uh, Riyadh Military Hospital, uh, you can actually demonstrate the virus uh, very easily. Without biopsy, you can still have the diagnosis if you have, or if you can demonstrate a, a viral count of 10 to the power four copies in plasma or 10 to the power seven copies in urine uh, with the uh, renal impairment, then uh, you can actually confidently say this patient has um, BK virus nephropathy. BK virus is actually a polyimovirus group uh, virus, and usually it is endemic and uh, uh, asymptomatic. Uh, carriers are there, and usually in uh, in normal people it doesn't do anything. Uh, but in uh, transplant patients, five to ten percent uh, with BK viral viral nephropathy will actually have uh, will actually have BK virus nephropathy. And the biopsy is the definitive answer. And with SV40 stain, you can actually uh, get the viral uh, inclusion body stain. Uh, sometimes it is focal disease, so we may actually miss with the biopsy. And usual recommendation is a three-monthly screening for uh, BK virus uh, nephropathy for the transplant patients, especially if you have, have using uh, if you have use, used uh, induction agents. And this is the electron microscopy, just to show you the comparison of BK virus uh, inclusion body with CMV, uh, easy to diagnose by electron microscopy if you have the facility. Now you are doing a clinic uh, and uh, this is the, and um, this is how we screen in clinic for BK virus nephropathy. That is a, uh, is a common questions, uh, question what your consultant will be asking you. Uh, if you, what, what is, what was the, what is your first line investigation for BK virus nephropathy as a screening? Will you do urine cytology? Will you do urine PCR? 
or a serum PCR, or you should go for a protocol biopsy or none of the above. So this is the urine cytology, which shows a decoy cell. Actually, I've taken it from, uh, uh, from our book. So you can see this is the decoy cell, which is, uh, uh, which is almost like a uh, ring-shaped nuclei. And then this is another, uh, but with hematoxylin strain. The, uh, your uh, pathologist should be easily uh, diagnosing this one. And it is a very easy one. Uh, and you can actually avoid all this biopsy and all these things. But this is the guideline by the Renal Association. Uh, every monthly you should do actually uh, urine cytology for all of your transplant uh, to look for decoy cell. If you do not have decoy cell, it's unlikely you have nephropathy. And if you get a decoy cell, then you go for all these uh, other tests. You can go for the serum, BK virus, PCR, urine PCR, and so on. And once you get these things, your main treatment is to reduct for the reduction of immunosuppression. Especially, you should actually reduce the cell sept, and uh, that should do the job. Now we come to case six. This is a 66-year-old man who was transplanted, uh, and then presents with signs of renal outflow tract obstruction, and they put a nephrostomy tube, which you can see, uh, which uh, did not actually show any improvement of his renal function. Then a biopsy was done. You can see this is the gloom, but around the gloom, you can see lots of lymphocytes. There's, there's huge lymphocytic infiltration uh, in the interstitium and periglomerular area. Now that's the closer view. And this is the CD20 stain for this um, interstitium and the gloom shows diffuse infiltration of CD20 positive uh, cells. So this is actually EB virus associated post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. And they present with unexplained fever, mononucleosis like symptoms with fever, malaise, uh, with or without tonsillitis, pharyngitis. And they also present with variety of gastrointestinal symptoms like bleeding, obstruction, perforation, abdominal mass, and so on. Sometimes they also present with hepatocellular and pancreatic dysfunction. CNS involvement is also seen. So usually, if you get this one, uh, they happen within uh, first year of transplant. And uh, EB virus seronegative uh, recipient, they have the highest incidence uh, if they get the uh, graph from a positive donor. Heart lung transplants, people, they have the highest incidence. And also, it's more associated with tacrolimus than sacrosporin, more associated with OKT3 or ATG induction therapies. Usually, uh, the treatment is you have to reduce the immunosuppression. But if there is no response and you have CD20 bodily disease, then rituximab is the answer. However, in CD20 negative disease, also rituximab uh, with CHOP. Uh, can uh, can do the job. So this is the guideline. You have to reduce the uh, baseline immunosuppression. You can also give antiviral, especially in case of EBV positive T-cell lymphoma, rituximab for th those who have CD20 positive. And if you have um, if you have no response or incomplete response, then you can actually add CHOP with rituximab. The same patient you can see in his native kidneys also, uh, there was infiltration of lymphoma. So diagnosis of PTLD is actually uh, easy. You can do either a biopsy or to, to see the extent of disease, you can do FDG PET in line with CT scanning. And in uh, further uh, evaluation, you can use actually PET CT uh, to see whether there is any uh, remaining tissue, malignant tissue after your treatment. Now we move to case seven. This uh, is a case of ABO incompatible cross mass negative transplant after this sensitization. You can actually uh, do ABO incompatible transplant, but you have to desensitize them. Uh, and this is the biopsy immediately after the transplant. This patient, after the biopsy, there was actually no urine output. 
uh, and the, the surgeon uh, responded the patient uh, kidney had pitted appearance and this was the biopsy you can see there is huge uh, clot within the uh, glome and also you can see uh, hemorrhage around the around the uh, capillary and also you can see the uh, intimal inflammation uh, in a uh, venial. This is the closer uh, view and there is intense CD4D staining in the peritubular capillary. So the diagnosis is actually a hyperacute rejection. You actually see within ABO incompatible non-desensitization. ABO incompatible transplant is uh, we have done actually in uh, military hospital more than 20 patients. Now probably it will be even more. Uh, their risk of rejection is high within first three to six months, but after that, it's the same as the other population, but you have to actually desensitize them, make sure their DSA, PR is low, and then you can go for the transplant. If you have the same, you can have the same hyperacute rejection if you have higher PRA and higher DSA, or if you have a positive T cell cross match. Now we move to case eight. This is a 44 year old patient. He received a first kidney transplant from a cadaveric donor in 2005. Then post transplant period, he was unremarkable with a baseline serum creatinine of two. In cadaveric transplant, you can have a little bit higher creatinine because we do not know what is the previous status of cadaver kidney, but this is not that bad. Uh, and then he maintained his creatinine up to the same level uh, till 2011, and his creatinine was 2.7 uh, when he came to uh, clinic. Ultrasound showed there is de novo hydronephrosis. Uh, a provisional diagnosis of obstruction was made and percutaneous nephrostomy tube was placed, but there was no improvement in renal function. An ultrasound was uh, done, which shows hypoechoic mask which is pulsatile, uh, having pulsatile flow pattern. And then a digital subtraction and geography was done. And you can see this is our nephrostomy tube, which was there, uh, which is probably not doing anything, but there is a pseudo aneurysm uh, at the junction of transplant renal artery, which is causing uh, obstruction. So the this is the transplant renal artery false aneurysm, which is a rare event, but it's a fatal one and it can cause actually hydronephrosis and graft dysfunction if it is close to the renal pelvis. And the aneurysinectomy uh, got actually the patient uh, complete resolution of hydronephrosis and the function was back to normal. Now this is case nine. We are almost coming to the end of our series. Um, we have a 50 years old transplant patient transplanted two year, two weeks back and on cytosporin. This is his discharge ke uh, chemistry. His creatine was 78, uh, which is in your unit is less than one. Udium is eight, platelet 230. He's, uh, he's on prednisone, cyclosporin and MMF. Now he comes to clinic after three days. His creatine is 210, which is grossly abnormal from his baseline. Urea is 20, potassium is 6, platelet is 90, and then CD4D was negative in the biopsy, and cyclosporin level was uh, 210, and this is the biopsy. You can see actually there is microangiopathy, uh, and you can see all the clog RBC within the uh, renal glomerular vasculature, and also you can see a microthrombi in a efferent artery. So this is actually CNI associated TTPHUS, uh, or thrombotic microangiopathy. So how to manage this one? Would you just stop the CNI? Would you stop the CMI, CNI and give plasma exchange, or just give plasma exchange, or convert to serolimus, or convert to tacrolimus? So cyclosporin basically, uh, it has some cytotoxic effect on the endothelium and that can cause platelet aggregation th and thrombus formation and gives the same uh, features like TTP. And also it reduces the activated protein C 
and also reduces the Adam DS13 activity. So all these things can give you the same features of DTP. So here uh, the guideline is you stop the CNI, change to something else like serolimus and uh, give them plasma exchange. So when you are changing cyclosporine to serolimus, you can actually give them uh, steroid uh, as a bridge for immunosuppression. And this is the uh, guideline. So you have to stop the CNI, give plasma exchange as soon as possible. And sometimes you can also get AMR or severe um, uh, severe rejection ongoing with them. So in, the, in these cases, you can actually add thymoglobulin. We are in number 10 case. Uh, this is, you have a 23 year old patient who is going for his second transplant. His primary disease is FSGS. The reason for his graft loss was chronic allograft nephropathy. So he was, he has, he has following donor for his second transplant. And now you have to find out which is the best uh, option. So all these donors he has, uh, they had a GFR of 75 ml. So he had, uh, theoretically uh, speaking, he had a cadaveric donor. He had a brother, 32 years, sister, 22 years, mother, 50 years, and father, 45 years. All of them are actually compatible donor. And uh, now you have to find out, and all of them are willing to donate. So now you have to find out which donor you will choose. Here, our expert opinion was mother of 50 years, because uh, in case this patient has uh, FSGS, which is familial, uh, it's very unlikely that mother will be uh, affected. She's already 50 years and she has a GFR of 75. So she is probably the best donor in this case. And the second best would be father. So in UK, second donation uh, is not actually uh, recommended in case uh, a live donation is not recommended if it is a pediatric recipient or the adult recipient who has a high recurrence raise rate or who have live donation. Although live donation is acceptable for uh, retransplant, if the first graft is not lost due to FSGS. So this, uh, this is our patient which the first graft was not lost due to FSGS. It was lost by CAN. So he's, he's a candidate uh, for uh, for retransplantation. And in these patients, actually, you can actually give them uh, plasma exchange uh, preemptively uh, to prevent uh, uh, recurrence. So prophylactic plasma exchange can be done. And the regime, regime generally includes, you have to give five pre-transplant and three post-transplant plasma exchange. So that's all uh, what we have. We had uh, 10 cases uh, and we'll have another series. So I welcome you to join our series with more difficult issues. Uh, and we'll also add the practical issues of transplant uh, in future.